Welcome to part one of our laboratory risk management webinar presented by the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, the Professional Association for Chemists in Australia. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, Chair of the RACI New South Wales Industrial Chemistry Group. The topic of this two-part webinar series is laboratory risk management. Risk management is an extremely important part of running any sort of organisation. Risk management, in fact, is a part of everyday life. We face risk every day in even the most simple tasks. This has been brought into focus through the emergence of the COVID pandemic. However, risks and the need to manage them has always been an important part of even the most simple of activities. Tonight, we'll spend some time focusing on risks in the laboratory environment, review the type of risks that exist, and what our responsibilities are, whether we are a student, teacher, employee, manager, or business owner. To add a personal note, my experience in the food and chemical industry has been that one of the most important roles a professional can play in an organization is to identify potential risks and to implement means to control them. So in my opinion, this is essential viewing. The webinar has been divided into two parts. The first is a presentation on risk management by Nigel Davidson, Senior Risk Management Consultant at Victual Industries. Nigel will discuss what risk management is, why it is important and how to do it. We'll have an opportunity after the presentation to ask any questions you might have. Uh, so please use the, the Q&A function. The second part of the webinar will be held in two weeks time. In part two, we'll hear from representatives from a variety of laboratory settings and we'll hear their experience of risk management and some of the challenges and opportunities presented by the current COVID situation. So please join us uh, for the second part of the webinar in two weeks time. Before we start this evening's panel session, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting all around Australia. We recognise the elders, past, present and emerging, and also recognise their contributions as Australia's first scientists and engineers, building a healthy and safe community, what they've done and what we can still learn from their ways. So to take us through the first part, I'm joined today, as I said, by Nigel Davidson, Senior Risk Consultant at Victual Industries. Nigel has over 15 years experience delivering world-class health, safety and well-being outcomes across high-risk industries in the UK, South America and Australia and New Zealand. With a strong emphasis on collaborative approaches to risk management, Nigel helps clients focus on developing and understanding their unique risk profile to provide clarity of priority areas to focus on and how best to minimise risk tailored to customers' needs. With that, I'll hand over to Nigel. Thanks, Matt. Um, much appreciated and thanks everyone for, for joining us. Um, so as was pointed out, today's session is on uh, WHS responsibilities. Um, we find that a really good starting point uh, because it helps drive some of the intent behind what we, what we do. So we can have a bit of insight into that. Having a look uh, just quickly at the objectives and agenda of this session, um, the first thing we'll do is just a bit of 101 on legislation. So what are the, the high level basic requirements? Um, then we'll look at lab risk management um, and what I call the backbone of compliance. Now we often you know, say to our clients that, um, you know, if you manage risk, uh, compliance will follow. And, and that's, uh, I think, a really good approach to take is um, rather than getting caught up in, you know, what specific clauses say in legislation, um, it all, all roads lead back to how you're managing your risk. So let's focus a little bit on that. Um, of course, the topic on everyone's lips at the moment is, is COVID-19. So we'll uh, you know, have a bit of a, a session on that and in practical terms, what, what some others are doing in this space. Um, and then, you know, at, at any time, um, you know, if you've got questions, keep them because we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end as well. Um, and I think ideally we would like to, to have this session as interactive and as practical as possible. Um, so um, that's where we'll try to take it. So if we start off with uh, WHS legislation, um, this is not foreign to other forms of legislation as well. Uh, it's a, a pyramid schema or framework. Um, and at the top, you have the Health and Safety Act. Um, and like all these regulations, the Act's regulations and, and code of practice, back in 2011, there was uh, a big effort to harmonize 
legislation across Australia. Uh, so that means prior to that, um, they were, each state had their, their own uh, legislation. So it was a little bit difficult, um, a bit more red tape for those that were managing national operations. Uh, that's not so much the case now. Uh, bar Victoria, um, you know, everyone else, every of the other states and territories are, are on board with the, the harmonised legislation um, or working towards it. And there aren't that many differences as well. Um, so that's that's the act. The act is very much around those high level duties as a as an organisation, um, and it talks a little bit about penalties and um, those sorts of things, all the fun stuff. Um, but I guess where, from practical terms, where you you would uh, look for if you wanted to go and see what the requirements were around a specific risk area, for instance, you would go to the next tier down, which is the regulations. So the health and safety regulations. 2011, um, uh, I think probably 600, maybe 700 pages long. So it's certainly not something you would read front to back. It's more uh, one of those things you would pick up to have a look at a specific risk area. So for instance, if you're working with asbestos, there's a chapter on asbestos. Um, hazardous substances, there's a chapter on that. Um, electrical work, the same thing. You'll, you'll be able to go and have a look at the requirements around that as well. Um, and then from that, underneath that, you have the codes of practice. And the codes of practice are, are separate documents grouped into those risk areas as well. Um, and nowadays, they're actually quite user friendly. So I'd recommend if, if someone is looking to get some advice or, or guidance on a particular risk area, they see if there's a, a code of practice available for it. Um, and they're actually quite user friendly and give some practical tips. And you can be pretty sure that if you are complying with the code of practice, you're also meeting the requirements for legislation tiers above it as well. Um, and then from there, um, you have the Australian standards, which are more you know, technical documents. I guess if any of you are engineers, you'd probably be well versed in a number of different Australian standards, but they can be used to help inform decisions as well around how to, to manage risk. Um, the key point here is to access this regulations or these, these, these different forms of legislation. Uh, you can get them on the Safe Work Australia website, who are the ones that uh, the, the government body that uh, produce these documents. Um, and they're enforced by the different straight state regulators. So you might find different state regulators um, that also put out information and, and you know you can work with and they work with industry as well. Uh, but they're there as an enforcing body. couple of key points with legislation. Um, as I mentioned, that harmonisation back in 2011 um, was the birth of the term PCBU, which stands for Person Conducting a Business or Undertaking. And to give you a little bit of history about that, um, prior to 2011, um, the, the legislation and the duties was all about employer duties and employee. They spoke about it in that binary form. Um, the problem with that was that um, an employer isn't really a person. Um, and so there was this sense that there was this faceless person behind a duty and a duty needs to be acted upon. Um, and so who's acting upon it? And, and so they could really not have a conversation and, and look and define whose responsibility it was to implement and uh, safe, safe workplaces um, and safe systems of work. Um, and that's where the person conducting a business or undertaking comes from. It's, it's that concept that it can be a, le a legal entity or it could also be an individual. Um, and so those duties remain so far as reasonably practicable to, to provide a safe place of work. Um, and the other thing as well is that the PCBU, because it's not employer, expands um, the, the, the idea that you know companies don't work in vacuums. You know we're all intertwined. We all have supply chains. Um, so if you work with designers, suppliers, importers, manufacturers, all those um, entities that you work with that you're intertwined with are all PCBUs, and all have shared duties. This this idea of shared duties um, throughout throughout the uh, organisation to provide a safe place of work. Um, the only other, the other thing there is that the burden of proof is on the, the prosecution. So we'll go into this a little bit more detail on the next slide. Um, but the, the idea is, is that if there was an un un unwanted event occur, um, then the prosecuting party would be demonstrating how you didn't exercise due diligence and, and provide that safe work environment. 
which brings us to the next level tier. So it goes one step further, the legislation um, from the employer or the company or the PCBU now um, and into the low, the level below, which is officers. Now, who is an officer? An officer is anyone that makes or participates in making decisions that affect the business or undertaking. So it's a very broad uh, definition and it's designed that way because it's acknowledging that multiple different parties within a company uh, can influence safety outcomes and has influence and control. And I guess an example of that would be, um, you know, finance directors or financial managers having um, control over budgets and spend and maybe a procurement department, you know, has some authority over if you're uh, going to procure a new piece of equipment um, and there's a very expensive piece of equipment which might have an added safety feature on it and, you know, another one that's half the price that doesn't have that. Um, if the organisation goes with that, that cheaper option and there is an incident um, as a result of that because of the faulty um, piece of equipment, then certainly in some capacity that procurement team uh, and those in, in authority in that position have um, in influence over those safety outcomes. And so that's what... Um, the officer is about is looking at within your own capacity, what influence and control do you have on your um, on your workplace. Um, there's some things around positive duty in there. So as an officer of the company, you must exercise due diligence um, positively. So you, it's not enough to uh, delegate that um, or sit at the executive level. You know, there's been ample case studies of case law in the past where, you know, general managers have um, or directors of organisations have, have come with the defence of, you know, I, I employ people to look after this stuff for me. I'm not on site. I'm in head office. This happened in another state or, or this accident happened in another country and um, that defence was, was worthless. Um, and so that's where this due diligence idea comes in is that you must actively seek um, to satisfy yourself that, uh, certain provisions are in place and that you've you've um, you've provided those provisions to to your workforce um, the officer could also be found guilty individually whether or not a PCBU is found guilty so that's another um, highlight another point to highlight there um, and in terms of middle managers like there's often discussion around who is who is an officer is there some clear definition of that um, this is very much something that's determined by, by case law as well, going back and looking at it. Um, but the key thing is, is that every organisation is different. So we can assume that executives are officers. Um, but when you're talking about middle managers, if you look at the example of a small, medium business, you might have a couple of people that hold all the authority that, you know, approves budgets and, um, you know, puts things in place and, and goes and uh, procures things. Uh, and so they have a lot more control in those couple of people as opposed to large organisations where that um, influence and control can be spread out over a, a vast majority of um, people. So due diligence. <laughs> this is essentially um, what, if there was an unwanted event to occur, this is what uh, the prosecuting party would go through, um, these six elements to try to demonstrate that um, you did not take reasonable care of uh, your, your workers or your workforce or um, didn't fulfill your duty under legislation. Um, and I'd like to go through these because these are quite important. And I, I guess if you were to walk away from this session with one practical um, key piece of advice, it would be to take these six elements, walk away, um, apply it to your own lab and your own position in that lab. Um, to go, you know, number one, knowledge of operations, of hazards and risks. So how familiar are, are you with your hazards? Um, would you be able to name what your, your top hazards were um, in your lab? Um, legal requirements, that follows on from that. And that's why I, I use that first, the, the knowledge of the hazards, because from that, everything else seems to flow. If you know your hazards, if you have a good understanding of your risk profile, you then can go and see what is the relevant legislation associated with those and what, what your requirements are. The other thing is, I'll, I'll ask is, um, did you ensure adequate resources? 
So they'll go through, um, and this is something, again, you can critique, critically reflect your, on yourself uh, around what provision of resources are there, what resources are you ensuring? And resources could be human resources. So, um, you know, are your staff overworked and fatigued and working long hours? Um, are they, is resources around the best equipment available to do the job, the safest equipment to do the job? Um, or it could be just systems um, as well, developing systems and, and processes to ensure, you know, that you're learning and um, that you're able to put plans in place to, to improve safety. Um, timely response to incidents. So again, we'll go back and look at, are you, um, is your lab recording incidents firstly? Um, if they are, how are you able to, to view those? And then what, what's being done about them? So it's not just enough to have people report incidents and, and near misses and things like that. Are you actually learning from them as an organization? Um, do, you, do you identify if something happens? Um, would you know if that happens, if that incident happens you know, once a week? Does it happen once a month? Or is it something that's very rare that happens? And, and that will help sort of guide your decision making as well. The last two are around you know, enforcing compliance. So um, you know, if there are gaps that are identified, uh, what's being done about it? Are there plans in place? Or are you just sort of walking by and, and um, not addressing them? And then verifying compliance as well. So this is really around how, how much you're engaging with your workforce, how much you're engaging with the work environment and verifying and doing some checks and balances. Um, if you're not doing them yourself, then verifying that they're being done by other, other parties or other people as well. Just reviewing that data. So they're the six elements. Again, this is a very critical concept around your responsibilities, your health and safety responsibilities under legislation, particularly as an, as an officer. But it's a really good blueprint to take away and just apply this lens over your own operations in the lab. So that feeds on uh, to the next slide, which is really that first one of the due diligence uh, circle, and that is the knowledge of your operations hazards and risks. So if we to look at this, um, and I was to ask you, what are your critical risks of your organization or in your lab, what, what would they be? If something was going to, it's quite a, quite a crude question, but if someone was going to die or be seriously injured tomorrow in your lab, what would it be a result of? And that's a really good question to ask, not only yourself, but to ask your team as well. As I said, that that's a really that's a starting point for for a discussion that you can have to look at. Okay, well, how are we managing those? So, if you don't already have that understanding, and if you don't think everyone would be on the same page, it's a really interesting exercise. Um, the amount of sessions that we run with clients, and we start with this question, um, the executives and the senior managers often have a very different view of what might be those um, what what might be those critical risks. And ultimately, that's where you want to focus your efforts on. If you're going to spend money, if you're going to invest, you want it to be on these these areas. Okay, so that's just something to, to think about. Um, and we'll go back to this a couple of times, back to this slide. Um, which brings us on to risk assessments. So once you have an idea of what those critical risks are for your organisation, um, you can start to, to risk assess um, based on you know, what you currently do, how you currently interact with those risks and what you can put in place or currently have in place. The thing I'd note about risk assessments is that um, at the most fundamental level, it's problem solving. Okay, so don't, don't get too worried about elaborate matrices and um, you know, scoring systems and template spreadsheets and those sorts of things. It's really about solving problems. So if we look at look at it through the lens of problem solving, a hazard is simply a problem, a hazard or, or an issue. Um, it's about identifying what they, what they might be in your, in your lab. So that's the very first step is to go and identify those, which the first step is going and having that chat with your team and, and coming up with that top five, uh, those top five critical risks. Um, and then the second part is assessing those risks. So in terms of assessing those risks, it's really just a means to prioritize action. Okay, which ones are you going to focus on first? Um, so that's really what I, what I want to um, focus on with assessing risk, not so much the matrix. It's a very subjective uh, tool anyway. Um, so it's just a really around prioritizing where you're going to focus your efforts first. 
And then the third step is controlling risk, which is the solution part. So this is the solution to the problem. Um, what do you currently, currently have in place? And we'll come back to that because there's a little bit more we want to talk on controls. But the fourth and last is reviewing and maintaining control measures. It's often the case that you go around and, and a control measure that you've come up with just isn't working. And that's okay, that's fine. It's about going back and just checking whether there's a gap there, whether you need to change things. Um, and that's, that's, that closes the loop on the, on the risk assessment process. But just jumping back to, to controlling the risks, um, you might have heard of the hierarchy of controls. It's been around for, uh, I guess, decades now. Um, and it's a way, a very easy way to validate the effort you're putting into um, coming up with those solutions for your hazards and all those control measures. So I'll just quickly take you through those. Um, if we look at elimination is the first one, I guess we could come up with an example. Um, perhaps you're, you know, you have an activity within the lab that requires um, getting some chemicals from a source and taking it to a work area or a workbench. And maybe that workbench is 10 or 15 metres away uh, from the source. Um, the way to eliminate that might be, um, I guess, you could review your operations and see whether it's a, a critical part of your uh, curricula. Um, and in a lot of cases, what we find is it's a very simple, straightforward question. Can you eliminate it? Can we stop doing that? Um, but a lot of the clients we work with uh, have to ask that question because they don't really get a sense or don't really ask that question. And, and so when they realise that they don't really need to do it, um, they could have eliminated something that they're just managing the risk on down the track for, for many different years. So if, if this is something that's tied back to a course curricula or an activity to, to satisfy for those that work in maybe tertiary institutions or schools, um, can it be eliminated by, by you know, not having it or, or doing something else instead of um, you know, that, that risky activity? So that's just one example of asking the question, do we actually really need to do it? Um, COVID, when we get into COVID, there's another example, which I'll, I'll draw back to this hierarchy of controls as well for elimination. The substitution might be, okay, this is a really uh, harmful chemical substance. Um, there's a lot of fumes that come with it. Perhaps it's corrosive to come into contact with. Can we substitute it for a chemical that's less harmful? Um, and so there might be some research involved there going out and, and seeking alternatives to it. Um, engineering controls might be something like, okay, can we reduce, can we modify our layout so we don't need to you know, be carrying it, uh, you know, 15 metres across the lab? Um, you know, can we bring, bring the source on a trolley, for instance, to the work areas and things like that? So you're starting to think of ways to, to mitigate the risk by putting engineering controls in place. And then administrative controls are simply things like training and processes and procedures. So in your risk assessment, you might refer to a specific procedure um, you might also go, you all might also state that, that um, your staff require some training and specify what that training might be. And then lastly, PPE or personal protective equipment might be putting on some goggles, gloves, coat, whatever it might be. Okay, so that's a quick run through of, of some examples um, of the hierarchy of controls. And what we find working with clients, um, and this is, this is right, right across industry, is that most controls that we see in risk assessments are those bottom two. It's the administrative controls and the PPE. And the reason for that is it's the easiest to implement. They're available, they're cheap, they're easy to implement, um, but unfortunately they're the least effective in, in mitigating risk. You know, you're relying on someone to, to put on that last line of defence um, and, you know, administrative controls, you're relying on people uh, who are fallible and make mistakes to have decision making around following a process, uh, which we, as we know in the real world, doesn't always lend itself to, to being implemented correctly. And so the thing is, if we were to look at the top three or above the line controls, as they, as they often call it, that engineering substitution and elimination, is that those things take time. You need, you need lead time to be able to implement those. They require planning, they require getting people together to talk um, to maybe liaise with suppliers and things like that. So they're not particularly easy to implement. And that's why people tend to focus on those lower end controls because they're straightforward. So what I'd say to you is 
when you are looking at your risk assessments, if you've got some lab risk assessments around there, around specific activities, a really good exercise to do is to go and have a look at those. And for each of the hazards, go into the controls column, see what you're doing in the controls column, and almost see what proportion of those would be above the line. See what proportion of the controls you have, are uh, either PPE or administrative, compared to those that are those higher tier controls. And I guess the, the key thing is that this is a, a validation tool for the effectiveness of your risk assessment. I think, um, you know, in recent times, the hierarchy of controls has copped a little bit of flack. Um, just because we're moving into, we're finding safety, health and safety and well-being is moving into that well-being space. And, you know, people are looking at, well, how does this apply to, you know, uh, well-being and psychosocial issues and, you know, fatigue management and mental health and those sorts of areas. And, you know, they, they have some merit in that. It doesn't exactly apply well to that, but use it for what it is. And, and that's, that's what, that would be my advice. It can be a very good, simple tool that's, that's easy to pick up and just apply to your, to, to your risk assessment just to see whether um, you've considered um, adequate planning as part of as part of your decision making process to implement controls. So from there, um, the the question is: Corona ready? Are you Corona ready? Is your organisation um, dealing with COVID nineteen? I know everyone's been grappling with this for the last few months. It's taken everyone by surprise. I think if someone told you that that we'd be in this state where everyone's wearing masks and um, people are in lockdown, states are in lockdown 12 months ago, you, you'd probably, you know, laugh, laugh your head off. But unfortunately, the sad situation is, is that we're all in this, uh, in this position and we've had to adapt. And what I'd just say is there's a lot of companies out there making money off uh, COVID-19 as, as something that you, you know, are selling you something that you must have to be elaborate and bolt on because you don't have adequate uh, means to manage it. But I would encourage everyone uh, to treat COVID-19 like any other hazard they have in the workplace. Because hazards by nature do crop up. Um, we find ourselves, um, you know, from one day to the next having to deal with different things. And coronavirus is one of those things. It's slightly more complex and has broader um, applications. But um, the, the fact is, if you have a management system in place, a means to, you know, risk assess and have procedures, then you're in good stead to manage COVID-19 and there's not a lot more you need to do. So things like, you know, inspecting and, and monitoring, those same processes should be used to go and inspect and monitor sanitation requirements around the lab or, you know, cleaning regimes risk assessment we've spoken about. It's about taking a, a lens of risk assessment and identifying what hazards related to COVID-19 transmission might exist in your lab. So again, you're using those same principles that you already have in place. Reporting, okay? So if someone does come into close contact with a COVID-19 case, um, do you have means to report and record that? The answer is probably yes. Training, you often, provide training to your employees anyway, it, it might need some awareness of which there's ample, an absolute plethora of um, materials and resources on, on government websites, Safe Work Australia, um, that you can access. The World Health, Organiser, Health Organization actually have free online training, which you can do, which are really good resources and will even give you certificates at the end of it as well for a, a different array of contexts. Um, you know, if you, if you want to be pointed in these directions, feel free to get in contact with me after this. I'd be more than happy to, to steer you in the right direction around links to resources and those sorts of things. Uh, fitness for Work is another one. You have a Fitness for Work um, process that aligns with, you know, if I feel unwell, um, what to do if I feel unwell, and what are the symptoms of COVID-19? And again, there's a, a free online resource from the Australian Health Department which anyone can go into and answer a couple of questions to see, you know, whether they, they might be best suited to get tested for, for COVID-19. So these are things that you can um, apply to your, your organisation and, and be comfortable um, that you have 
the things in place already. The last one there is around incident response. What do you do in the event of? Um, and that there would also be, be covering um, what to do for, for someone that is a confirmed case of COVID-19, which we'll go into a little bit of detail later on. So if we've got those systems in, in place, it's really about being adapting, ad adaptive now to, to new risks and, and issues that emerge. Um, the way we like to, to look at it, if you are going to look at COVID-19 in your own lab, is to look at it from the lens of your people, so your staff, um, where may they be exposed to transmission risk. Having a look at the lab itself, so the physical environment and the layout of it, and then your clients. So this may or may not be relevant, could be students if you run um, you know, educational institutions, but just looking at it via those different streams allow you to see different points where they might be, where there might be exposure risk. Um, and if we look at it in practical terms, so if you were to go away, um, these are some ideas and examples that uh, other, other people in industry we've been working with have, have implemented. Um, so the key thing here is if you were to, to um, summarise everything in two words, it would be safe spaces and safe surfaces. Okay, so going around spaces is really looking at that 1.5 metre physical distancing and surfaces are looking at sources of contamination on surfaces. So looking at those common touch points throughout the, um, throughout the lab. So we have a look at uh, some physical distancing. Again, I'm gonna refer back to the hierarchy and this, this goes back to um, the elimination part of the hierarchy. So what did the first thing a lot of people started doing, especially those in, in white collar environments, those office workers was remote work. You know, you cannot, you cannot um, get COVID-19 and you cannot transmit COVID-19 if you aren't at work, if you're, if you're at home. Um, and so that was a really effective way to bring community transmission rates down. And they were able to do that uh, through doing, through implement, implementing remote work. Redesigning layouts is, a, is another one. Um, so for your, for your lab, um, just looking at where and how people interact with each other. Um, are there two people working together in pairs often? If that's the case, are they standing on each side of a bench facing each other? Or is there a way where they could be you know, potentially back to back or staggered um, if they do have to face each other? They're just looking at those sorts of things. Um, substitution is, is about looking at um, the shift as well. So a lot of staff we find um, have implemented shift A and shift B. Um, and the reason for that is if someone in shift A becomes a confirmed case of COVID, then that, wipes, that doesn't wipe out their whole staff pool. So that's just something to, to think about as well. You're able to have a contingency or, or backup staff. Um, looking at points where people might gather and loiter, uh, particularly you know, if you have students, it might be entry exit points. Um, some organisations we, we've worked with have looked at just introducing a one way in, one way out um, where possible, but that's very dependent on, on the type of um, facility you have. And then things around activities. So looking at what activities people get together, um, you know, perhaps you can stagger lunch times if, they, if there are lunch rooms that your staff do um, go at the same time. And, and also considering the commute. So commute is in these mass transit systems uh, are very much a, a source of potential contamination risk. So it's looking at, um, can you stagger start and finish times to be able to avoid peak hours and things like that. Um, then we go down to physical separation and barriers. Um, you might've seen a lot of this in, in the retail space, um, point of sale, you know, paying for something at FPOS um, or maybe at your favorite cafe. Um, the point here is that you know, in some cases, you, you can't avoid um, some staff members being face to face with customers. And although um, it might be a, a small fraction of the time over a working shift that can accumulate and uh, turn and finish as being quite a high exposure level. So um, think about if you have reception areas um, or maybe, you know, you have deliveries coming in and people need to sign in um, and you manage those areas as part of part of your lab or part of your operations. And it's something to think about if you can't remove people from that face-to-face um, -face contact, even um, if it's only for small amounts of time, but it's over a, a full shift. 
And then personal protective equipment. Uh, again, the government advice here uh, that we're seeing now is that if you're in, if you can't maintain that 1.5 meters distance, then they recommend the use of a mask. Um, an example of that would be on you know, public transport and things like that as well. Cleaning and hygiene, uh, going on to that, there's some contactless methods that are being used. You'll see QR codes instead of signing in. So that's certainly something you could think about if you do have a sign in process at your lab. Um, can you implement QR codes that people can just scan in and then fill out their, their details? Um, this particular one that you're seeing now is, is from the New Zealand government, which is supplying this free to, to all their businesses. But um, it's a very cheap and, and easy solution to get up and running as well. Um, Again, going looking at those common touch points. So besides the normal things like doorknobs and handles and, and light switches, look at your lab and the equipment that are used there and, and shared, you know, whether it's gauges and taps and levers and those sorts of things and work out um, how we need to make that form part of a cleaning regime. Again, these are in terms of physical distancing and um, contaminated surfaces. In cleaning regimes, there are checklists you can take from that Safe Work Australia website and apply it to your own workplace very effectively. So they're good things, they're good, some good resources there to, to take away. Again, happy to, to pass those on if you um, just get in touch. Soap and water obviously is the best, uh, best uh, solution there for, for cleaning hands. Um, but in the absence of that, Senate hand sanitizer is really good. It's portable, you can put it anywhere. So something to consider um, there as well. Uh, and waste disposable is about minimizing contaminated materials. So you, if someone has materials that are contaminated, you don't want them leaving it on, uh, on bench tops and things like that in the lab. You want them to dispose of it as quickly as possible. Um, so it's about providing enough waste, waste disposable so you can facilitate that. And then lastly, on the right hand side, you've got equipment and materials. So have a look at your labs and, and have a look. Shared PP is a common thing that we see. Um, so, you know, do you have goggles that you share amongst your staff or students, lab coats and that sort of thing, um, gloves perhaps, and uh, obviously there's some controls that will need to be implemented there and um, it might be ideally to, to have personal PPE, but if that's not possible, um, you might need to look at um, some sort of sanitation or cleaning regime around those after each use um, or potential disposable alternatives. Uh, same thing applies to workstations and computers. So just making that part of that cleaning regime and also the delivery of goods. So the delivery of goods is probably worth a little bit more conversation um, just because it's been the source of a couple of cluster outbreaks for a number of different industries. Um, if you think about someone delivering goods to your, uh, to your lab, um, it might only be 15 minutes that that process takes place and it's there and then off they go. But what they've actually done is potentially left contaminated surfaces that they've picked up across 10 different sites that they've delivered to on that day. So they're picking uh, exposure risk up from the warehouse or the depot, wherever they're picking up the materials from, and then going across multiple different sites in that day. So that does present a, a considerable risk for, for contaminated surfaces. So um, I guess the, one of the best things you can do, which ties back into that PCBU duty is to consult and work with your suppliers and understand what they've got in place to manage the COVID risk as well. So you're all in this together and um, want to work together to make sure that you have some, some processes in place. But in, in some instances, it might be worth coming uh, where possible to, to clean surfaces of any goods that are, that are delivered as well. Um, another, sorry, just while I think of it, another one for deliveries is uh, we've had, we've worked with clients that um, have initiated uh, contactless delivery verification as well. So rather than signing off when the delivery driver comes um, with a pen that's obviously been contaminated uh, through multiple different parties, uh, also having, you know, email verification or photos or something like that as well. So that's just another, another idea for, for practical implementation. And then beyond those physical aspects, there's uh, the support that you can provide as well. Okay, so when we look at support, uh, mental health and well-being is something that we've touched upon. Um, you know, this is a situation that's provided a lot of stress and anxiety um, 
to many people, you know, millions of people across the country and the world. And um, there is support available out there. So um, in, in the interest of protecting and, and taking care of your, your employees and your workforce is communicating that there are resources available. So Beyond Blue and, and Lifeline and a number of others have specific dedicated COVID-19 um, you know, support uh, groups that uh, can provide help to, to anyone that needs it. Um, the other thing to note is that especially where uh, remote working and, and home-based work, working is being implemented for, for companies um, is that not every home workplace is a safe workplace. And that's important. There are There is a proportion of uh, Australians that do that are victims of um, violence and abuse in the home environment and so it's something to be aware of and um, be able to have a conversation with your managers or managed staff um, that they can um, verify and inquire and provide support where needed so that um, people aren't put in harm's way. The next thing is around training so infection control and COVID risk. I've, I've spoken a little bit about, about uh, resources available on the World Health Organization site. There's a heap of uh, training materials on the Department of Health website as well. Um, hand washing techniques, you've probably seen a heap of posters around different places around the correct technique for washing, 20 second rules and that sort of thing. Um, what to do if you feel unwell. So again, getting that symptom checker online um, and also some some uh, resources you can get online to help with that. Uh, ergonomic setup, if you are working from home, what does a good ergonomic setup look like? What's a work from home checklist? Uh, so they're things that are quite practical that you can implement quite quickly. And then what to do if someone is a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19. Um, and you can see the, the image below is something taken from Safe Work Australia, which is a bit of a guide, different steps to take um, but to implement that in your lab, it's, uh, it's, it's very much um, taking the approach of, okay, what would I do if I were to implement this now? So if you look at step number one, isolate, um, it's looking at your lab and going, where would I isolate someone so that they don't spread contamination to the rest of the lab or to other areas? So it's about having an idea in your head, communicating that, um, talking with your staff around what the, what the protocol might be where it would be and that sort of thing and who do I inform. So um, it's, it's about bringing that to life as well. And then lastly on the, on the right hand side is around awareness. Um, regular updates and, and communications is really important. Um, what we'll find and what you've probably uh, witnessed as well is, is uh, quite a bit of uh, opinions being thrown about out there around what should be done to manage COVID-19 risk. Um, it has turned quite political in, in some instances. Um, all I'd suggest there is that you pick a source or two, um, credible sources that you can uh, refer back to and help inform your decision making around what you, what you do and, and take that advice on board. Um, and I'd suggest things like the Australian Department of Health or Safe Work Australia, um, or globally, if you want to look globally, the, the World Health Organization also. Um, so it's about picking those and, and using those as your um, your medium for, for communicating to and forwarding on to, to your staff and students. Uh, COVID, COVID Safe app is obviously something the government has pushed out to the wider population as a, as a tool in their toolkit to help with contact tracing. So that's something that you can encourage the use of. Um, and also awareness around reporting to the regulator. So it's a legal requirement. It's called a, a notifiable workplace incident. Um, if someone is a confirmed case of COVID that, they, that was contracted at your workplace. So um, you might have seen in the news, um, you know, some organisations that have been in the news from, for both the wrong reasons and the right reasons where it's been managed effectively um, and other organisations where, you know, they've let clusters grow and, and significant community transmission has followed as a result of a poorly managed um, uh, COVID-19 case. So just something to be aware of so you can mitigate and, and control it as soon as possible. Um, the last thing there is around signs and posters. So this is you know, not needed in all instance, instances, but if you have particular areas uh, of your facility that are very hard to, to maintain that, that 
physical distancing of 1.5 meters, then it might be something to put, you know, stickers on the ground like you see um, in other places, just to keep it front of mind. So what does all that look like uh, in a risk assessment itself? Um, again, not, not too fussed, don't worry too much about uh, templates, but this is a template that is taken from Safe Work Australia. So I thought it'd be a good idea just to give you an example of what that looks like. Um, again, in, it looks like this one is, is for COVID-19. So if you look at the hazard column or the problem, um, it's, it's looking at, okay, COVID-19 transmission. Um, and then a little bit over, you've got talking about the risk level. Again, this is just remember a means to prioritize um, that, that risk to your, to your organization or to your lab. And then what controls are you going to put in place? Um, and there's things there around, you know, plexiglass and social distancing. And remember any, any control that should be in there should be implementable. So it shouldn't be a statement that you can't go away and do something with. That's just a really good rule of thumb just to check that it is in fact a, 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 an effective control. Um, and then put in actions by and, and when as well is always a, a good thing because you can just guarantee that it is something you can implement. Uh, so that's a, a little bit of an example. Um, I think we've gone you know, full circle uh, from the legislation and the, the duty and the, the requirements under legislation to risk assessment to how practically you might um, implement that in your, in your lab. Um, I hope that's that's been uh, informative. As I said, very happy to uh, have a chat outside of this if you wanted to to get in touch. If you've got any questions that might be specific to your own uh, contact, your own lab, um, yeah, get in touch with me. I'm happy to point you in in the in the best direction I can as well. Uh, so with that, I might uh, hand it back to to Matt. Thanks very much, Nigel, and thanks for the the presentation. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, so. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A function or, or on the chat. Um, I might just start, Nigel, just a, a general question about the, the regulation. So I understand that the, the states have some different regulations um, and just wondering if, you know, what those differences are and does that have any effect on the need to, to manage risk in your particular organisation? Um, so I would say no is probably the, the, the short answer. Um, there's not real, real significant uh, differences between the states now, particularly since that harmonisation uh, back in, in 2011. Um, as I said, you know, Victoria still uh, or haven't come on board with that harmonisation. Um, there are some minor differences there. Um, you know, in some aspects, there's, they're, they're broader um, and in others, they're more specific. It just depends on what, what the topic area is. Um, but on, on a level of practically implementing and, and showing due diligence, um, there wouldn't be anything that I would say is glaringly different uh, about um, either, either territory or state. I think it's more um, that risk management approach is applied right throughout all the states and territories. And that's something that um, I think if we focus on then, then the compliance aspect is, is um, by default something that you, you're going to have um, in play anyway. Yep, well, thanks Nigel. Um, uh, another question is, you mentioned the, the responsibilities um, of the people conducting the business unit um, and the responsibilities of officers in the lab setting there's often students whether that be university or or school students what sort of responsibilities do those group of people have um to towards safety and, and risk uh so sorry did you just want to repeat that matt is it around students or um staff members you were referring yeah to? so looking at students whether it be students in a university or students in a in a school environment yeah so um, the the onus there is really on um, the PCBU to um, convey and communicate their requirements and provide that safe place of work. Um, and then, if they, this is often the case, is where students will uh, get you know their rules and and site rules and regulations communicated to them. Um, but certainly, you know, the public and students uh, wouldn't be. Um, 
wouldn't have wouldn't be a duty holder under under legislation yeah so their duty really is to follow the, the rules and to do what what's being asked of them to participate in safety by their their actions and their compliance i guess absolutely yeah okay uh, i've got a question about the stage three and stage four lockdown in victoria um uh, one of the biggest issues that non-essential laboratories basically have been shut down overnight. Um, a lot of businesses have continuity plans and risk management documents which cover shutdown plans. But what would your advice be to enable organisations to be able to, um, I guess, prepare or, or execute that shutdown uh, and process, you know, in a short time? I guess this is about emergency readiness. Is that uh, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is something that I, I would assume no one had in their business continuity plan 12 months ago, and now it's sure. in everyone's uh, BCP. So um, I think I think that's, that's something that everyone's uh, grappling with. I think, um, you know, that whole essential, what is essential, what, what isn't essential. I think in this case, if, if it's non-essential, um, people are really looking at what what can they keep going remotely i mean if if they're shut down and people can't go to a to a place of work um it's yeah it's really a, a case by case basis it's going to be dependent on each each laboratory and um what they can actually get away with um i, I think particularly for, for victoria um which is stage four lockdowns um uh, I'm not too sure of the specific requirements there for, for government. I know there's there's a list um, of what you can and can't do for, for certain industries, but um, I think, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's, it's caught everyone out um, and the business continuity side of things is um, something that's just going to be um, more important as we move into the different tiers as well. I think um, it's not something that's going to go away straight away. I, I think there's, as, as Victoria has shown, you know, you can come out of uh, restriction or, or lockdown and then back into it um, a few months down the track. And so what I would say is if you're preparing um, to come out of lockdown, um, also prepare to go back into it as well. Um, and that should give you a, a, enough lead time to be able to prepare the next time it, it, it comes it comes down. Yeah, I, I think the follow-up question there, you know, th there's a laboratory standard. So uh, standard 2243 looks at a number of aspects of laboratory safety. Should the standard be extended to look at the emergency shutdown of laboratories in a safe manner? Um, I mean, I guess there are, I mean, the safety standards talk about emergency management, don't they? There's a there's a provision yeah. that's essential. So this is yeah. an extension of that in, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'd say, I mean, under the regulations, there's also a requirement um, to have a an emergency management plan. Um, and I would simply put this as part of that as well. So how to shut down your uh, laboratory safety in this, in this scenario. It would simply be another scenario that I would add to it. Um, and it might need to be shut down uh, without much planning, like you say, particularly if it, uh, you know, is a, as a result of a confirmed COVID case, for instance, or, um, you know, there's a potential outbreak, this is something that could come without much warning. So I'd probably advise people to um, look at these scenarios as part of their emergency response plans. Yeah, it sounds like the, the, the pandemic sort of um, eventuality that people probably put on the risk assessment has become something that's that's now in sort of sharp focus so it, it's a risk that, that's become uh, real and and so i'm sure it'll be incorporated into many plans in the future absolutely uh, yeah so that's that's good advice a couple of just quick questions so um just about the the, the copy of the slides and and whether uh, people are able to access those if i i guess people can contact you nigel and and ask for um for yep. a copy yep. um and and ask any other additional questions so i think that Absolutely. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm happy to provide any information I've got. Um, so feel free to, to get in touch. Happy to do that. Perfect. Thank you. And just a last question, um, just on the format for the risk assessment. Um, I think you mentioned there are formats available, but uh, is that something you'd be able to guide people uh, if, if they were interested in yeah. sort of uh, checking a format or, or starting with a template? Yeah, yeah. Also happy to do that as well. Yeah, as awesome. I said, they are available on... 
um, the Safe Work Australia website, but uh, I can point, point you in the, in the exact direction of that if need be. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, so tonight's been a, another event, part of the activities of the New South Wales uh, Racky Industrial Chemistry Group. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be conducting the second part of the um, Laboratory Risk Management webinar in two weeks time. So that's the 22nd of September, the same time, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's a, a Tuesday as well. Um, Nigel will join us as will um, a number of representatives from uh, a couple of different laboratory settings. Um, and we'll hear their experience of risk management and some of the particular challenges and opportunities presented by COVID building on the, the framework that Nigel has been talking about. So uh, that'll also be quite interactive. So please uh, attend that. We've been, uh, we've had recorded uh, recording of this event um, and I'll share a link uh, to that recording over the next couple of days. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, Nigel very much for his time, uh, for the excellent presentation um, and, uh, and all the information that was pre presented tonight. I think it was very, very helpful and very concise. So thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, right. Thanks everyone for listening and um, good night and stay safe and we'll see you in two weeks time. Thank you very much.